Well, it just occurred to me uh, how it must be if we had any visitors to see the drummer come up and preach the sermon. It must be terrifying. And I am mindful that we all had a one hour less sleep last night, so um, if we do have anyone nodding off, I might go over to the drums and hit a rim shot <laughs> just to keep everybody on board here. Uh, well, it's my privilege to get a chance to speak to you today, and the thing that God has put on my heart is to talk about the church as God's family. And um, just to give you a little history, I, I grew up going to church. I was, some of you know, I grew up in Boise, Idaho, God's country. And uh, my folks took me to church uh, every Sunday, pretty much. We went through spells when we didn't go to church, but. For the most part, we went to church, and I remember in high school really not understanding why everybody showed up, because I didn't find it to be particularly helpful to me. I remember all the sermons could sort of be reduced to, you know, God's up there, he loves you, pass the plate, see you next week. And I couldn't see the relevance in my own life to what, to what I was living and what I was going through. It kind of was a place we went, but I never thought of it as anything more than an obligation. And I really didn't think about getting to know anyone, that's for sure, uh, beyond just the surface, how do you do? I remember uh, as soon as the last hymn was sung, uh, I would stand up and I would notice that my father was already halfway down the aisle. He was out of there and, you know, didn't want to talk to anybody. He wanted to get home and, you know, get out of his suit. We always wore ties and suits. And uh, he wanted to get back to his easy chair and, well, lunch, but his easy chair and watching TV. Um, in college, I became a Christian. And I started going to a little conservative Baptist church in Greeley, Colorado, where I was going to college. And I remember just being amazed that the people in the church actually knew each other. I mean, they knew each other well. There were deep relationships within the church. Uh, they cared about each other. And in was Paul being a male chauvinist, but he made an amazing statement there when he said, um, there is neither male nor female. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female in terms of you know, your place in the family of God. We're all in Christ. Christ is all and in all, or you are all one in Christ Jesus. So this is really, really important for us to remember as we talk about the church is we're all one in Christ Jesus. We have this Savior, this amazing God, uh, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in common. It gives us a commonality that goes beyond anything anywhere else. You know, if you get together with fellow people that have the same hobby or uh, same interests, that can create somewhat of a brotherhood. But we have something that surpasses and transcends all of that we have in common as the church of God, as the family of God, we have in common Jesus Christ, our Savior, who brought us into this family, into this household of God. And so that's why we have the closeness, or why we can have the closeness of a family. So um, this might be just a little loud. I feel like it's feeding back just ever so slightly. So Paul says in, in Galatians three or Galatians six ten he says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. So here we see that 
while we're to be good to everyone, we are to be good especially to those who are in the church, God's household. So the church should be the focus of our good deeds. The church should be the center of where we show our love in the same way that our families should be a place of love and caring. The church is our family. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. So we are to focus our love on each other. This should be a place as the family of God where love abounds among us. I think our church is a good example of that. Um, I think we do a pretty good job of loving one another. Uh, of course, we can always improve. But um, I always come to this place feeling like I'm coming to a loving, a loving place. But how do we love in God's family? Let's just talk about that. What, is it, what does it look like? Well, in John, uh, John quotes Jesus in John 13, 34, and 35. One of the great verses, one of the great memory verses. If you're going to memorize a verse, this is a good one. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, Jesus is saying to the disciples. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. For by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So it's a new commandment in the sense that now, I guess the Jews at, at that time you know, believed in loving one another, but it was kind of like love your, your friends and your brothers, but you can hate your enemies. But Jesus is saying, let's take love to a completely different level. Love the way I loved you. And how did Jesus love us? Well, it was a sacrificial love. He gave himself for us. He emptied himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So that should characterize our love for each other, sacrificial love, giving of ourselves. He was a servant. He said that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So we should love each other by serving one another, looking for ways that we can serve others. Um, he's very faithful to us, right? Jesus is a faithful friend, a faithful savior. He never gives up on us. So that would be another way that we could love one another. If, we, if we're faithful to one another, if, we're, if we don't give up on each other. Notice too in this passage that Jesus also says that all men will know that we are his disciples if we have love for one another. When people see us loving in this way, they will wonder about it. How can people love each other in this way? That's how I felt when I first came to that church after becoming a Christian. I'd never seen love exhibited that way. And it was a tremendous encouragement and inspiration to me to see this group of people, this brotherhood, this family of God, loving each other in that way. So when, when people on the outside see the church loving each other the way Jesus loves us, it opens the door for discussions about Jesus and his love. And it, it's a way to draw people to him. And we see that in the early church, that people saw the early church and were attracted to it because of the way they saw the people in the church loving one another. And uh, it spoke to them in that culture. Another great part of Colossians 3, 1 through 17 is the passage that says, Therefore, as those chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience bearing with one another and forgiving one another whoever has a complaint against anyone just as Christ forgave you so also should you this is 
Remember, this is a letter from Paul to the church, telling the church how to live as a family. And he's telling them to live with a heart of (coughs) compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We're supposed to bear with one another. And don't we have to do that? I mean, I know people bear with me. Oh, here he goes again. You know, whatever. Um, But we have to bear with each other and forgive each other. We have to have a heart of forgiveness, not a heart that holds grudges or judges each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone. And the whole reason that we do this is because of Jesus. Think of what Jesus has forgiven me for and you for. How can we then not forgive others? Just as Christ forgave you, so also should you. It's a tremendous passage. um, And it really shows us how the church should, should live. That should be a picture of what the church is like. There will be conflicts and disagreements, just as there are in any family, but the way to deal with them, or the way we deal with them, will indicate how much we love one another, the members of our church family. No discussion of the church would be complete without mentioning Acts 2, 42 through 47, which says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the picture of the church. This is the early church. We see here the church in action. They're relating to one another as a family would. Some things they did might not be relevant to our time and culture, like maybe selling everything and living communally, like some of them did. But we see real evidence here of love. And we see that people saw them and wanted to know about this love that they had for one another. And it it drew them to Jesus. Wouldn't it be great to be able to go back in time and go to those, some of those early churches or the very first church in Jerusalem and see how they interacted and, and loved one another. Uh, I've, always, I've always loved the whole idea of a time machine. Uh, I used to you know, love that movie of the H.G. Wells uh, story of the time machine where the guy goes back in time, or he actually goes into the future in that one. But um, to be able to go back and just just watch and see what the early church was like would be really something. And we have some descriptions like this that give us an idea of how they related to one another, and it's a beautiful thing. Well, we don't want this to be a pie-in-the-sky kind of discussion because we still have to ask the real down-to-earth question, which is, what about people we don't like? We have to talk about this because it's a real issue. We don't naturally love everyone. There are some people that just rub us the wrong way. Or we may simply just have nothing in common with them other than being their brother and sister in Christ, which of course is, is, is huge. But if we're really honest, we have to admit that some people are easier for us to love than others. And that's just the way things are. What do we do about that? Well, I think it's good to remember here what kind of love God is calling us to. He's not calling us to some syrupy, sappy, feeling, emotional kind of love where we 
you know, go around just feeling this deep affection for each other emotionally. I mean, that's nice, and that may be the way we do feel about some. But the kind of love he's calling us to is agape love, which most of us know is not a love that's based on emotion, but it's, a, it's an action, it's a choice that we make to love other people. And this is something that comes to us because we are believers and because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, we can make the choice to love others. Even those people that kind of bug us or, um, well, let's face it, God called us to love our enemies. So that pretty much includes uh, everybody that could be difficult to love. If they go down to the level of our enemy and we're still called to love them, then we don't have any excuse. We have to love everybody, even the people that drive us nuts. God's been showing me a lot about this lately. Um, I won't go into it too much, but um, it's something that I've had to learn a lot about because naturally, my natural inclination is if somebody drives me nuts, I just try to avoid them or get away from them. Um, and sometimes that's not possible. And God is telling, has been teaching me how to love them um, even if they do drive me nuts. Because I know I drive other people nuts, so it's all good. We can love people too when, when we see people the way God sees them. And I think that's one of the key ways that God works in us to make us more loving. Every person we see, even the person that's a jerk, is infinitely valuable. They have infinite worth. God loves them with an infinite love. Jesus died for them. Even that person that's hard to deal with for me, Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them. Each person that you come in contact with is an everlasting spiritual being made in the image of God. That kind of makes it hard not to, not to choose to love them when you realize that. God, I believe, and this is part of what I've been learning, God places challenging people in my life and in the church sometimes for our own spiritual growth. God loved and loves everyone, and he calls us to that too. So it must be something that we can do. It must be possible for us to love our enemies and love everyone because God commanded it. God told us to do it, and if, if it was not something that was possible, then he wouldn't have told us to do it. So see those around you that may be challenging to love as gifts from God for your own transformation. That, that does change the way you see them. When you see that person that, oh, there's so-and-so again, think, there's so-and-so again. God's gift to me. God's, the person God has anointed to expose the deep, dark evils in my character that otherwise would never, I would never know about them. And this person is so skilled at being able to bring them out in me. Thank you, God. Thank you for this gift. <clears throat> so this person may be exposing areas in your character that would be forever hidden if you didn't have to interact with them. <clears throat> it brings out all the bad reactions that you've stuffed down and hidden all your life. There's no chance meetings with God. There's no uh, coincidences. So when you have to deal with these people, whether they're in the church or not in the church, pray about it. Tell God how you feel about this person. You can be totally honest with God. You can say, God, you know, 
I really don't like this person that much. Or you can go even further than that if you want to. And God will listen to you. And you can listen to what the Holy Spirit tells you about that whole relationship. Make it your aim to love that person no matter what. And it will change your life. It really will. Because remember, God is in the business of transforming us into the character of Jesus. And he'll do whatever it takes to bring that about. And sometimes he goes to, to drastic ends to, to do that because he's faithful and he doesn't give up on us. And um, when you have the perspective that every time you're in these difficult situations with people, it's a gift. It's not a, it's not, oh no, but it's, oh wow, what is God going to teach me? What can I learn? How can I adopt the right attitude in this situation that I'll be open enough to receive what God has for me? It's not easy. It's not easy. Especially if we've formed a habit over the years of pushing those people away or insulting them so they'll leave and never have to deal with them again or however you've been trained in your past to deal with those kinds of people. God says, no, we're going to retrain you. And here's this person, gifted by me to help you make these changes. Well, speaking of gifts, the church is God's gift to us. And know this, we cannot grow in Christ if we are not part of a local church. God has made no provision for the Lone Ranger Christian out on his own. And we've all heard the, the people that say, oh yes, I'm, I'm a Christian or I'm spiritual, but I don't like organized religion. I don't want to be a part of that. Well, <clears throat> in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, the well-known verse says, and let us consider how to stir up or stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. God has called us to become part of a local church. We, we need to be a part of that, and I'm obviously preaching to the, to the choir here because you're all in church, but um, just know that our, our membership in a church is, is something ordained by God. This is how God works in our life is through the church. In Colossians 3, in that passage that I love so much, 1 through 17, he says this in one part of it, let the word of Christ deeply dwell within you, church, teaching and admonishing one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is how we're supposed to be interacting within the church. When I come to church, I don't want to come with the attitude of what can I get out of it, but how can I admonish and encourage and build one another up, build others up when I come to church? Um, and when I do that, other people build me up as well and encourage me. Um, <clears throat> we sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs together. Um, that is a part of our fellowship and worship of God. So we bear up one bear one another's burdens. We rejoice with those who rejoice, and we weep with those who weep. We lift one another up in prayer, and we're concerned about one another. We're not to just look out for our own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. All these verses. Are, are given to the church as a family. This is how the family of the God is supposed to be interacting and, and functioning. The church should take care of its family members. That's why we have the Benevolence Fund, which I know reaches out and helps many people in our church. It's helped me, it's helped us. That's why we have G2 groups to develop even closer-knit family relationships. 
and to build each other up and to encourage each other, teaching each other. That's why <coughs> we have prayer requests that we make known to the church so we can lift each other up in prayer and support each other that way as well. That's why we have family nights and fellowship together because we're a family, because Jesus has brought us together as, a, as the family of God. So let me conclude, and I'm going to quit a little early because I'm going to give you back some of the time that, that Sam took from you last week. <laughs> And I know that we're all going to need a nap because we had to get up an hour earlier. But let us thank God for our church, Covenant Baptist Church. We've gone through our share of difficult times since I've been here. But God has always been faithful to watch over us and to guide us in the way that we should go. I have personally grown much because of my association with covenant. God's used CBC greatly in my life for which I will always be thankful. And when I look out into this group, I see specific people who over the years have touched my life, who've stood by me through some pretty dark times and who have been used by God to speak into my life and to draw me to him. And I will, I will always be thankful for that. Covenant Baptist Church is my church, my family that God has given me, and I'm committed to the people that make up our family, and I hope you are too. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this church. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you are currently doing in our midst and that when we come to this church, we come not just to hear a sermon or to sing a song, but we come here to be a part of your family, to interact as a family, to, to see and, and talk to people that we love, and to, be, to minister to others and to be ministered to by others. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless Covenant Baptist Church that we would grow in our ability to love one another and excel still more, that we would not forsake our own assembling together, but that we would encourage one another and stimulate one another to love and good deeds, and all the more as we see the day drawing near. We pray this and praise your name in the name of Jesus Christ.